sure good to have a top-notch transmission man in your shop. And when you've got one like Fred there, who's willing to share his knowledge with less experienced men, it's even better. Hi, Fred. Say, you're not planning on putting that old valve body back on that completely rebuilt torque flight, are you? Why not, Dick? There's practically never anything wrong with the old assembly on these jobs. <laughs> never anything that can't be corrected by a thorough cleaning, that is. Actually, dirt is the valve body's biggest enemy. Not damaged parts or mechanical troubles. Yeah? Well, that may be so, but the valve body looks so complicated. Don't let that scare you off, Dick. With a few simple precautions, you can do an expert job of servicing these assemblies. For example, never put the valve body or transfer plate in a vise. Use the valve body stand. When you remove or install the valves and plugs, don't use force. And don't drop any of the valve parts. They're more apt to be damaged by careless handling than they are by use. Good point, Tech. And here's another. Be sure and get the valves, plugs, and springs assembled in the right order. Don't trust your memory. Follow the manual illustrations and instructions. When you remove the spring bracket, don't disturb the line pressure adjustment screw. It was set correctly at the factory to give the right line pressure. There's no reason to readjust it unless it's been tampered with. Whatever you do, don't adjust that screw to compensate for a pressure drop caused by internal leakage. I'll remember that. What's next? Cleaning. Since dirt is the number one enemy of the valve body, cleaning's the number one cure. Clean all the parts thoroughly and finish up with clean solvent rinse. Dry them with clean, dry, compressed air. Don't use a cloth. You'll leave lint. How can you be sure the valves will work when you rebuild the assembly, Fred? That's easy. Just slip a valve into its bore and tilt the body back and forth so that the valve will move back and forth in the bore. Don't lubricate the valve or put in any springs for this test. If the valve doesn't move freely, look for burrs. You can polish down slight burrs with crocus cloth. Be careful not to round off the land edges. Sharp land edges are essential for proper operation of the valve. In reassembly, be sure to put the one large ball check valve in the large chamber in the valve body. And be sure to tighten all screws to the specified torques, particularly the screws for all the valve cover plates and end plates. You see, Dick, you don't have to know exactly how each one of these valves works to do an expert job of servicing the valve body assembly. Just remember that dirt is usually the cause of valve body trouble. The cure is spotless cleaning and careful reassembly. Well, that sure clears up a lot of my worries. Guess I just had buck fever when it came to getting into the valve body. But tell me this, how do you determine when the valve body needs cleaning? Proper diagnosis, Dick. Beginning before you ever lay a wrench on the transmission. And this is equally true of every torque flight complaint. Remember, with any transmission trouble, not only do you have to correct the immediate trouble, like a burnt out clutch or band, but you must also determine and correct the underlying cause of the trouble. I can understand where accurate diagnosis might save a lot of needless work on fairly new transmissions, but it certainly didn't help you on that high mileage job there. You still had to overhaul it completely. Don't be too sure of that, Dick. Diagnosis gave me a good idea of what to look for and concentrate on as I worked on that job. Diagnosis beats guesswork every time. Why not give Dick the lowdown on how to diagnose talk flight complaints, Fred? I'll be glad to, Tech. The dipstick can tell you two things. It will give you an idea of the condition of the transmission fluid, as well as indicating how much fluid there is. So that's the first thing I check. If the fluid's low, I suppose the hydraulic system will be starved and won't operate the clutches and bands properly. Exactly. And if the level's low, the transmission may shift okay when it's hot, but not when it's cold. That's because the fluid contracts as it cools. Right. And a high fluid level is just about as bad. It can result in foaming, and foam plays hob with the operation of valves, band servos, and clutch pistons. Here's a point to remember when checking fluid level in the current torque flights. 
These new transmissions are much flatter than previous models. Now that's good. It cuts down the transmission hump in the passenger compartment. But you have to read the dipstick more carefully. When the fluid is warm to operating temperature, it should never be above the full mark or below the add one pint mark. If I'm not sure about fluid temperature, I recheck it after the road test. Now, here's something else to watch for. The sample of fluid on the dipstick might tell you still more about the problem. For example, if the fluid has a black color and a strong burnt smell, that's real trouble. That's caused by a badly overheated clutch or band. It's either burned out or about to go. If the fluid looks milky, it's because there's water or antifreeze in it. This condition isn't very common, but it is possible since engine coolant deteriorates O-rings, seals, and friction material, a complete overhaul is called for. If you find this condition, be sure to find out how the engine coolant is getting into the transmission fluid. Check for a leak in the transmission oil cooler in the lower tank of the radiator. What's the next step in diagnosis, Fred? Don't overlook the importance of engine performance. If engine output is low, shifts are apt to be delayed and unusually harsh. Why does engine output affect shift quality? If engine output is low, the driver has to step on the gas harder to accelerate. The transmission throttle valve is advanced too much, and throttle pressure is too high in relation to engine torque. Don't adjust throttle linkage to compensate for poor engine performance. Make sure the engine's tuned up. Then, if shifts come too soon or are mushy, throttle valve advance and pressure will be slow. If shifts are delayed and harsh, throttle valve advance and pressure may be too high. So throttle linkage adjustment is important to good shift quality. Right. And of course, push button cable adjustment is important too. Here's a quick way to tell whether the push button cable adjustment should be checked. Push the neutral button and gun the engine. If the car tries to move with the neutral button in, you better check the push button cable adjustment. Keep your foot on the brake when you do this, or you might drive your customer's car right through the shop wall. How about giving Dick some tips on road testing the transmission? Coming up, Tech. I always like to take the owner along when I road test his transmission. That way, he can demonstrate exactly what his complaint is. After that, I drive the car to bring on the condition the owner's complaining about. At the same time, I notice the speeds at which the transmission shifts and how its performance is in general. Before you try road testing a transmission complaint, go out and drive a few torque flight jobs that shift smoothly and at the right speeds. Then when you road test one that's not working right, you'll be able to make a better comparison with the performance of a normal unit. And while I'm at it, here's one more suggestion for something to do before we get deeper into the subject of road testing a torque flight. I suggest that someone turn this record over. Okay, Fred, I followed you so far. Now, after you've driven the car to duplicate the trouble the owner's complaining about, what's the next step in the road test? How do you find out which clutch or band isn't working right? That's not as difficult as you might think. After all, a torque flight transmission is basically just a mechanical planetary gearbox that's shifted hydraulically by applying clutches and bands. When you're road testing a transmission, try and remember which of the clutches or bands should be applied for each push-button position or gear ratio. That may be easy for experts like you and tech, but there are two bands, two friction clutches, and one overrunning clutch. How am I ever going to remember which ones are applied, which are released, and what all the gears are doing? Don't try, Dick. Keep it simple. Just think about the two bands, the two clutches, and the overrunning clutch. Don't worry about planetary gears. They don't cause shift problems. This simplified chart in the reference book will help, too. It tells you what should be applied for each gear. It might help, but tell me. What does this chart have to do with road testing a transmission? You'll see in a minute, Dick. Let's consider one gear at a time and see what can be learned on a road test. In breakaway low, the rear clutch and the overrunning clutch are applied when accelerating. 
but the overrunning clutch is a one-way coupling. It releases on deceleration. There's no engine braking in breakaway low. In number one button, low, the rear clutch and the low and reverse band are applied. The low reverse band is a two-way coupling. It gives a low gear ratio for both acceleration and deceleration. I still don't see why they need the overrunning clutch and the low and reverse band. They use the overrunning clutch because band-to-band -band shifts between low and second are hard to synchronize and very apt to be harsh. You explain it, Fred. For smooth one-two upshifts, the overrunning clutch simply overruns as soon as the kick-down band is applied. For smooth closed throttle downshifts, the overrunning clutch simply coasts until the driver steps on the gas to accelerate again. Now I get it. When the number one button's pushed, the low and reverse band is applied to provide maximum engine braking. But tell me, how can that information be used on the road test? If there's slippage in low gear with the number one button in, as well as in breakaway, the trouble must be in the rear clutch. The rear clutch is the common drive element to both breakaway low and number one button low. In second, the rear clutch and the kickdown band are applied. What can you figure out from that, Dick? Let's see. If the transmission slips in second, but doesn't slip in breakaway or direct, the trouble must be in the kickdown band, not the rear clutch. Right? Right. If the kickdown band slips too much, the transmission will shift from low to direct. Skip second completely. In direct drive, both the front clutch and the rear clutch are applied. Obviously, any slippage can be only in the clutches. Ah, let's see now. The rear clutch is engaged in direct, second, and low. So if there's slippage only in direct drive, but no slippage in second or low, it can't be the rear clutch. It must be the front clutch. Good. That's the way to reason these problems out. In reverse, the front clutch and the low and reverse band are applied. If there's slippage in reverse, but no slippage in direct drive, the trouble is probably in the low and reverse band. Now I'll bet I can answer my own question about the road test. After you've identified the trouble the owner is complaining about, then operate the transmission in a different gear where only one of the two questionable elements is applied. This process of elimination should narrow the trouble down to one clutch or band. But where do you go from there? You still haven't located the cause. True. But you've got a good idea where to look for it. If the problem's traced to a band, and you can find no evidence of deteriorating friction material in the fluid, perhaps all that's needed is a simple band adjustment. You don't even have to remove the transmission oil pan to adjust the kickdown band. And don't overlook the push-button cable and transmission throttle linkage adjustments either. These adjustments will correct many shift complaints, and they're good insurance against more serious transmission problems, too. Okay, I can see where adjustments will take care of a lot of complaints, but don't try to tell me they're all that simple. If adjustments don't do the job, what's next? Hydraulic pressure tests are next in order. They can be made quickly without disassembling the transmission. And they help to tell you where to look and what to look for before you do any disassembly. You'll save time if you check the suspected circuit first. For example, to check the front clutch circuit, test the line pressure and front servo release pressure. If line pressure is okay, but servo release pressure is low, there's leakage in the front clutch hydraulic circuit. Just make sure your gauges are accurate. Right, Tech. Here's an easy way to check gauges. After you've made the line pressure and front servo release pressure tests, just switch the positions of the two gauges and repeat the tests. If you get the same readings, the gauges are okay. If you don't, one of the gauges is wrong. To locate trouble in the rear clutch or kick down band circuits, Test line pressure. To check the low and reverse band circuit, test the rear servo apply pressure. Just be sure you use the 300 pound gauge for this test or you'll wrap the needle around the stop peg. 
It's a good idea to use the lubrication pressure test if there's a problem of overheating or transmission fluid blowing out the filler tube. The governor pressure test helps to track down the cause of erratic shifts or a no reverse condition. But remember this, only the rear pump feeds the governor. So don't suspect the front pump of causing low governor pressure. Both the governor and the rear pump can be serviced without removing the transmission from the car. Here's a tip. You can test for a sticking governor by applying air pressure intermittently while slowly rotating the prop shaft. At one point, a distinct click will be heard if the governor is free. Sometimes that blast of air is all that's needed to free a stuck governor. What's the story on using air pressure to test servos and pistons? Frankly, Dick, the air pressure test won't tell me anything more than I've already learned from the hydraulic pressure tests. Tell you where I do use air pressure tests, though. After I've overhauled a transmission, the air pressure tests are the best way I know to test the seals and make sure all pistons and servos are working right. That's a good idea, Fred. Do you have any more suggestions along this line? Whenever you smell that strong burned odor, you can bet on a clutch or band failure. Some of the valves and passages are probably clogged with friction material, too. Be sure to clean and flush the entire transmission, including the torque converter, oil cooler, and cooler lines, and replace the filter, too. Now just remember, bands and clutches don't fail without reason. Find and correct the cause of failure. Careful inspection of all the parts is your best insurance against comebacks on a major transmission repair job. And don't forget to use the reference book for this session when you're troubleshooting a torque flight transmission. Well, Dick, this information's been fired at you mighty fast, but it should take the mystery out of torque flight diagnosis. It sure has. You guys have convinced me that you don't have to be a hydraulics engineer to handle torque flight service. Let's see if I can summarize the major diagnosis steps. First, always check fluid level and fluid condition. Second, road test the transmission with the owner along to make sure you know what the complaint is. And use the road test to see if you can pin the trouble down to one of the clutches or bands. Third, see if the trouble can be corrected by some simple adjustment of the push button cable, throttle linkage, or bands. Fourth, if an adjustment doesn't correct the problem, test hydraulic pressures before disassembling the transmission. Fifth, it's seldom necessary to replace the valve body assembly. Since dirt is the usual cause of trouble, the best answer is a thorough cleaning of the valve body and transmission. Good work, Dick. That's the right approach to talk flight diagnosis. You know, if all you technicians will use the information in this session, It'll help you do a better job in less time. Equally important, it will help you to avoid comebacks and keep your service customers satisfied.